how deep is the maternal love and sacrificial nature of motherhood? In life, we learn that motherhood includes compromise and compassion. King Solomon encounters two women in a confrontational situation. Solomon's wise judgment reveals the heart of two mothers. These mothers show the great length they're willing to go to protect their child. It highlights the deep impact mothers have on shaping their children's lives and their futures. In Bible times, to bear a child outside of marriage was cause for a separation. A woman could be disowned by her family. Unwed mothers often turn to prostitution for financial support for them and their family. The Bible says that one day two women who were prostitutes came to Solomon for justice. Understand that a dispute arose between two prostitutes who were also mothers. Solom Solomon willingly received the two prostitutes at his throne. Like Jesus, he also welcomed sinners. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So don't you look at these two prostitutes in disdain, for all have sinned. But even though Solomon accepted sinners, Jesus did more than just solve people's immediate problems. Jesus, he changed their hearts. Jesus was able all to forgive sin. The Bible says that one of the women said, My master, this woman, and I live in the same house. She's my roommate. I gave birth to a baby while she was there with me. So in biblical times, brothels and prostitutes were a part of everyday life. And Solomon's handling of the two prostitutes case implies that even prostitutes had limited rights. Even persons of the lowest statue could gain an audience with the king. Three days later, this woman, as she's telling Solomon, King Solomon, also gave birth to a baby. No one else was in the house, this is important, with us. There were only the two of us. The first woman presents her case against the other woman, her roommate. And these are the facts of the case as we know them. Both women lived in the same house with no other residents. Both women were pregnant at the same time. The first woman gave birth to her child, followed by the second woman three days later. So the first woman goes on. One night, this woman rolled over on her baby and it died. So, the second mother, who gave birth three days later after the first woman, killed her baby by mistake. She suffocated her child when she rolled over on the baby in bed. Now, there's a term called cold sleeping or bed sharing, which is dangerous. It's when parents put a baby in their adult bed with them to sleep. And statistics say that over 3,000 infants die every year in the U.S. from sleep-related deaths. So the first woman continues her story. So during the night, she took my son from my bed while I was asleep. She carried him to her bed. Then she put the dead baby in my bed. Now, this is when things start going, getting a little weird. As they say, the devil is in the, de the details. So first, we now know that they both gave birth to sons. Secondly, never underestimate the schemes or the wiles of the devil. What mother, after discover discovering the death of her baby, thinks this way? This disturbed thinking is out of the twilight zone or the outer limits. Some of us may be old enough to remember those TV shows. So this woman plans and executes an elaborate deception by the next morning. 
We never know whether she ever grieved for her loss of her child or whether she had any regrets for her actions against the first woman. We do know without divine intervention, she would have lived her whole life owning this lie, living this lie. So the next morning, again, the first woman is speaking to King Solomon. The next morning, I got up to feed my baby, but I saw that he was dead. Then I looked at him more closely. I saw that he was not even my son. Imagine the first mother's thinking. While putting this twisted puzzle together in her head. There's a dead baby in her bed. But it's not hers. But at the same time now I've seen another baby in my roommate's bed. So my mind thought is whose child is that? I remind you that nobody is in the house, in the room, but her and her roommate. Next, she's probably asking, is her roommate pretending even to be asleep because some, something is going on? I can, in my mind's eye, I can see her staring a hole right through her roommate. Imagine the first mother standing over her roommate. She's trying to confirm the other child's identity. Now it's been biologically proven that a mother knows her child. There's a term in the field of zoology called imprinting. It's when a newborn animal comes to recognize a parental figure. It is based on the first thing they see after birth. It's built in their DNA. And that first thing can be another animal, uh, meaning that uh, the first thing that a cat may see could be, can be a dog or vice versa, it can be a person, or even a thing. But remember, the DNA is set up that the first thing they see is a parental figure. Likewise, a mother and baby are bonding while the baby is in the mother's womb. The imprinting process starts after birth, and, and the mother first looks at her child. Mothers know their child. Not only by looks, but also by actions. Mothers even know the difference between their identical twins. But the other woman, who is the roommate, said, No, the living baby is my son. The dead baby is yours. But the first woman said, No, the dead baby is yours, and the living one is mine. So the two women argue before the king. Now, there were no witnesses to the incident. Under normal conditions, when there was witnesses, priests and judges would handle this case. But with no witnesses, the law required them to go to King Solomon. The king was considered to be the highest court of appeal. We have to, re we have to realize today, a case like this would never reach the courts. Because we have special tools for this type of altercation. You might be familiar with, with some of them. Smith & Wesson, Remington, Glock, and AK-47. This situation probably would have been handled long before it got to the court. But, the Bible says, Then King Solomon said, Each of you says the living baby is your own. And each of you says the dead baby belongs to the other woman. Remember, Solomon didn't have the help of a DNA test. Most judges would be confused by the women's conflicting claims. But with his God-given insight into human nature, Solomon knew what to do. God had given him the ability to see the world from a spiritual viewpoint. King Solomon had the unique ability to put spiritual truths into action. It's a miracle that both women made it to court before the king. Especially after the first woman identified the baby as her own. They went to court under the charge probably of child abduction. It could have easily been murder, attempted murder, 
a, a first degree assault. Then King Solomon sent his servants to get a sword. They brought it to him. He said, cut the living baby in, into two pieces. Give each woman a half. Now you may assume that the king had gone mad. But it was a legal tradition in the ancient Near East. If a judge couldn't verify who owned a, a disputed piece of property, it would divide it evenly between the two contestants. Solomon's application of this tradition in this case was brilliant. Solomon knew what would happen by giving these orders to his servants. He knew the woman who was lying wouldn't resist. But he also knew the maternal love of the real mother would object. She would rather surrender custody to her rival rather than stand by and witness her baby's death. The real mother of the living child had a real love for her son. She said to the king, please, please don't kill him. Give the baby to her. But the other woman said, again, and this is the other woman, the roommate, who claimed that it was her baby. Listen to her words. Neither of us will have him. Cut him in two, two pieces. So the mother in this story was willing to give her child, the real mother, to give her child to another in order for her beloved child to live. Today, an unwed mother who can't support her child may do the same. This is a, this is a choice that they can support them financially or emotionally. They may choose to make their child available for adoption. Now, giving your child to another doesn't mean you don't love your child. It may be the greatest act of love a person can show toward their child. But an unwed mother can always trust God to bless her child. The circumstances behind a child's birth doesn't limit the child's capabilities. And it doesn't limit that child's potential in God's eyes. Then King Solomon said, after hearing the first woman, give the baby to the first woman. Don't kill him. She is the real mother. And to encourage your spirits, on this, let's go to the scripture, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15, and it reads, The Lord answers, Can a woman forget the baby she nurses? Can she feel no kindness for the child she gave birth to? Even if she could forget her children, I, talking about God, I will not forget you. So God loves you more than any mother has ever loved her own son or daughter. Everything he does in your life, he does it out of love. God allows even the hard times that we go through to benefit us. So as we conclude, did Jesus show his love for us by his sacrifice on the cross? He who had no sins died for the sins of the world. And if you enjoy Christian content, please subscribe to our channel. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Goodbye.